Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome all back. Uh, so we are going to uh, start with uh, team number two. Uh, their topic, uh, re-victim, re-victimization and re-traumatization of women in criminal proceedings. Uh, so the first presenter is Nisa Slyden. Uh, you can, you may start, uh, Miss Nisa. Thank you. And again, five minutes. Please be careful with that. Um, dear professors and dear peers, uh, firstly, I would like to wish you all a good afternoon. My name is Lydon and I'm a second year law student at Istanbul University. I must mention that I am more than grateful to have the opportunity to take part in this edition of um, Law and Bosphorus Summer School and also be a part of my dear team, Team Pippa Baka. Um, let me start by talking about the topic of our team, which is the victimization and re-traumatization of women in criminal proceedings. According to UNODC, which stands for United Nations um, Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, the term re-victimization, or also known as secondary victimization, refers to the victimization that occurred not as a direct result of the crime, but through the response of um, institutions and the individuals to the victim. In our case, re-victimization happens when um, criminal proceedings cause psychological and social harm to the victim involved, who mostly is a woman in our case. Um, This act is a serious and an undesirable effect of the criminal justice system, and it includes the failure to acknowledge uh, and treat the victim with respect, and approach the victim in an insensitive and unprofessional manner or discriminate against the victim in any form. So how does the victimization occur during criminal proceedings? Um, there are many factors contributing to this. For example, re-victimization can be caused by the repeated exposure of the perpetrator to the victim throughout the criminal process. And also similar to this repeated and unnecessary interrogation on the same facts over and over again and insensitive or inappropriate um, comments or assumptions uh, to the victim cause the victim to relieve her painful or traumatic experiences. And the intrusive or judgmental conduct by uh, criminal justice personnel Uh, such as the doctors, the police, or judges and prosecutors, also has a drastic uh, negative effect on the victim. Essentially, the entire process of uh, criminal investigation um, can result in secondary victimization, uh, such as the interrogation, the prosecution, the trial, or the conviction. Uh, The reason for this is that those who order Uh, who are ordering the criminal uh, proceedings do so without taking the victim's uh, perspective into account. Um, To be more specific, justice justice providers may be gender biased towards victims, uh, for example, labeling women as a gullible, dishonest, uh, or a liar, or a conspirator. So, and they may ask or allow questions um, that are offensive or irrelevant to the case um, about the victim's motivation, her lifestyle, her sexual history or sexual orientation. Uh, This type of manner shifts the focus to the victim's actions rather than the offender's actions and this leads to victim blaming. Lengthy delays in criminal trials, lack of privacy and legal assistance and victim support uh, also play a a big role. in the women's victimization. Revictimization not only damages the victim's self-esteem and trust and faith in the legal system, but uh, it also damages her reputation and her credibility um, in society. Therefore, it affects the victim on so many levels, um, psychologically, socially, and legally as well. Many studies show that victims who seek legal and medical help feel blamed and ashamed, and they are also hesitant to seek or ask for further help. Uh, Actually, in one study of rape victims, 52% of them appraised the contact with legal system as harmful and traumatic. 
Um, so you might wonder, are there any regulations regarding this issue? Uh, the European Union has recently taken steps to put the victims at the heart of the justice system. Uh, for example, the Budapest Roadmap and also in particular the uh, Victims' Rights Directive from 2012 are considered as milestones. All member states except Denmark have uh, signed this directive and it is therefore now up to member states to implement all aspects of the directive and make sure that the victims uh, know and receive their rights. Finally, I would like to conclude my speech on the most important note, which is the Istanbul Convention. Uh, the convention addresses and instructs the necessary measures for women's revictimization in articles 15, 18, and 56. Uh, my teammate Gaye will actually go in the, into the details of these articles in a minute. And I'd like to conclude by saying uh, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, here are the professors and the graduates. Can you see my uh, presentation? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but it's little. Yeah. Could you please um, lo loudly speak? Uh, uh, dear professors and dear colleagues, my name is Gayatri Özgürlü from Yashar University of Faculty of Law. Firstly, I want to thank my teammates who have presented before me, Ms. Asla Aydın, and I would like to present uh, the introduction part that includes the traumatization of women in criminal proceedings. Firstly, I will be, uh, define what is the traumatization. Victimization describes the uh, experiences of survivors who encounter victim blaming attitudes, behaviors, and practices from services, uh, providers, and institutions which result in additional trauma. In other words, victimization refers to additional traumatization during a survivor's interactions with professional and processes in the justice system and other fields, medical, behavioral health, and even services designed for victims. In addition, the term re-traumatization is not frequently used in cases of sexual assault and uh, violence crimes uh, from intimate partners. It also includes dismissive uh, or, or uh, unresponsive actions that may be uh, made by uh, police officers and support services. Secondly, I would like to mention uh, some research about re-traumatization in criminal proceedings. According to research, trials may have other negative psychological effects uh, that have uh, to be distinguished from the traumatization effects, such a, uh, as uh, effects on other leaders in self-esteem, leaders in uh, social trust, or persistent rumination about uh, injustice experiences in the trial. Other uh, research in future time may show that the gaps uh, in the court system and fully re traumatization of victims. Actually, the most terrible issue is uh, testifying in open court too, uh, for victim. Very often, the victim must provide her account directly in front of the person who created a lasting trauma. Open testimony requires a survivor to narrate a painful and triggering account of abuse and uh, attacks around which she may still uh, struggle with shame and embarrassment. Finally, as it's mentioned that uh, I will be described that more detail uh, the related articles on re-victimization and re-traumatization in, in the Istanbul Convention. Firstly, uh, according to the first paragraph of Article 15, 
partly child provide or stringent uh, appropriate uh, training for uh, the relevant professionals dealing with uh, victims or perpetrators of all acts uh, of violence covered by the scope of this convention on the prevention and detection uh, of such violence activity uh, between women and men, the needs and uh, rights of victims, as well as on how to prevent secondary victimization. In other hands, third paragraph of uh, Article 18 says that parties shall ensure that measures uh, taken person to, uh, to this chapter shall aim at avoiding secondary victimization. Finally, the third paragraph 56 uh, requires that uh, parties shall take the necessary legislative or other measures to uh, protect the rights uh, and interests of uh, victims, including their uh, special needs as witnesses at all states of investigation and uh, uh, judicial proceedings, in particular by uh, providing uh, for the protection as well as that, uh, that of their uh, families and witnesses from intimidation, mutilation, and victimization. Thank you for your attention and listening. The uh, next part will be explained by Elena Mikuli, who is my teammate. Hello everyone and sorry for the delay. So, uh, dear professors and colleagues, I'm Elena Mutevelli, a law graduate from Athens, and today I'm more than excited to welcome you in my short presentation about the current situation in Greece. First of all, I would like to present the legal framework that is applied in my country. Then I will refer to some official reports regarding gender-based violence or GPD and re-traumatization. And eventually, I will indicate the gaps in current protective mechanism. Also, to begin with, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, so as you can see in that slide, my country's approach toward CPV is based on three dimensions. First, international, second, European, and third, national one. So uh, Greece signed and ratified the Istanbul Convention so the above mentioned articles are implemented. Furthermore, Greece, as a member of the European Union, has transposed the 2012 and 2011 EU directives about victims' rights with corresponding state obligations. Last but not least, apart from strategic plans, some new laws were introduced, modernizing the law about domestic violence and penal code by criminalizing, among others, stalking a non-consensual sex act. So, um, according to the Convention, some specific measures needed to be taken to tackle GPV, such as founding shelters or counseling centers and 24 7 uh, helpline. Greece, in fact, complied with these obligations, something that proved to be extremely helpful, especially during the pandemic. According to EU 2012 uh, Directive, member states like Greece. Uh, so ensure respectful, sensitive, and professional treatment of the victim throughout the whole process, and avoiding, for example, the authorities to ask irrelevant or personal questions or the direct uh, visual contact of the victim with his or her offender. Provisions like these leave much room for improvement in the current practices. So moving on to the next slide, we can see, unfortunately, a tragic number of femicides during the last year, which is the last and worst case scenario of repeated domestic abuse. According to the statistics, most of the perpetrators were either victims, husbands, or straight spouses. I would like to briefly refer to a recent incident that soaked our society, uh, where a man stopped to death his wife after years of domestic violence. And despite the neighbor's calls to the police, the officers did not investigate it properly with due diligence in order to prevent that femicide from happening. They actually claimed uh, that this is a family issue and with which they could not interfere. Something totally opposite to the convention, uh, which explicitly refers to GPV as a really serious uh, matter with corresponding state obligations 
or zero tolerance approach. That officer's uh, attitude is a result of the remaining stereotypes and prejudice among societies, which is unfortunately quite common among the criminal authorities, not only in Greece, but in Turkey as well, as Selzen will say you soon. So another interesting part uh, is the underreporting rate. Since one in four women uh, does not report a violent incident to the police because of shame or fear for further blaming. Provocative questions like, uh, why didn't you leave the house earlier? Or why didn't you report the incident immediately? Save the burden to the victim. While challenges on medical evidence, it result in gradual um, institutional distrust. We can now see the paradox that the very judicial system, which is, which is supposed to protect the victims, actually uh, quite often deepens the victim's traumas. So uh, according to data from the Ministry of Justice, as you can see in the second slide table, um, despite the increase in reports and prosecutions compared to the previous years in Greece, still the number of convictions is pretty low, only one in four actually. That shows a deficit in the provided legal support and relief. National level, the lack of a systematic training, the lack of strict monitoring of the responsible officers, and of course, a lack of adequate psychological support of the victims throughout the whole process. And in addition, yeah, of course, the significant delay of our criminal proceedings hinder the chances for effective protection and implementation of state's obligations according to the provisions mentioned before. Citizens who face real victimization by criminal authorities in Greece can only contact our ombudsman authority filing a complaint when any post-trial support or communication with the victim is not provided, unfortunately. So thank you very much for your attention. And now my dear friend Selzen will describe you the current situation in Turkey. Selzen, the floor is yours. Hello, I hope uh, you can see my screen and hear me. Um, dear professors and colleagues, I'm Selcan Pekar from Istanbul University Faculty of Law. Uh, today in my speech, I will um, talk about re-victimization and re-traumatization in Turkey. Um, most of the time, re-victimization and re-traumatization is interbent. Um, there are various behaviors and procedures that cause them. In Istanbul Convention, preventing victimization is intended with the Articles 15, 18, and 56, um, as my teammates already have touched more deeply. Uh, Article 49 and 50 is about space obligations as well. I would like to give information about positive and negative regulation and execution in Turkey uh, relating the repeated victimization and traumatization. First of all, protecting and preventing violence against women is not an incapability. There are regulations uh, such as treaties and codes. The main problem here um, is the implementation. Failure to use protective laws and treaties, lack of information, undue prolongation of judicial um, proofs, failure to ensure victim security throughout the process, and lawyers' behaviors affect the trust of victims, and gender stereotypes, prejudices, humiliating comments, and victim blaming deeply afflict victims and causes the isolation and traumatization. In Opus case, um, European Court of the Human Rights observed that there is a systematic failure of the state uh, to take prevention measures against domestic violence. Uh, according to the brief facts of the case, the victim was harassed with death threats from her husband, who also threatened to kill her mother over a period of four years. The ECHR held that Turkey was in violation of European Convention on Human Rights. The state failed its obligation to guarantee right to life without torture and degrading treatment, without any discrimination under the Convention. This was due to the lack of implementation of effective criminal law provisions and preventive measures for the Protect, protection of the victim and her family members, 
on the existence of a real and immediate risk. Um, Turkey also violated the non-discrimination principle on failure to recognize domestic violence and honor killings as a gender-based violence that affects women uh, as per Article 3A of the Istanbul Convention. And also when victims report domestic violence to police stations, police officers do not investigate their complaints and convince them to return home and drop their complaints. In this connection, police officers consider the problem as a family matter, which causes secondary victimization. And about uh, implementations that prevent victimization, in Turkish penal code, there are special and general crimes uh, like abortion, mistreatment, and there also are uh, violence prevention and monitoring centers, um, as Shunim and Kadem, and that women who have suffered violence or at the risk of being a victim of violence can apply. And number, uh, law number 284, an action plan on human rights aimed to prevent victimization and re-traumatization as well. Um, now, uh, according to grievous Turkey report, in case of sexual crime, violence, and femicide, victims uh, cannot find a suitable social and judicial guarantee to disclose the perpetrators who caused the traumatic situation. The Grievy report expressed the concern that gender behavior and violence against women and uh, accusations of victims lead to a reduction in trials. Attention was um, drawn to the low rate of reporting um, violent incidents to the authorities due to the lack of economic independence of the victims, the low literacy in legal tech, and the distrust of prosecution and uh, trial authorities. It was pointed, uh, pointed out that rape and sexual violence cases almost never reported by the victims. Now, um, thanks so much for your attention. I give the floor to my teammate, Evro. Uh, her speech is about uh, revictimization by the criminal justice systems. Hello everyone, my name is Ebru Gümüş and I'm third grade law student at Istanbul University. Today I'm going to uh, present our team topic within the scope with the revictimization by the criminal justice systems. Um, as you can see, three ways victims can get revictimized is not being believed, intensive questioning and criminalization. According to UA experts, 49% of victims felt revictimized during the court. The lack of the protection in court is still provoking revictimization when, for example, victims are confronted by a second testimony with the traumatizing facts. To change this, the victims need a well-defined role in the criminal proceedings, but also limited unnecessary interactions to prevent them from feeling revictimized and living through the experiences again. It's important for the judiciary to take control and responsibility of the court case. Uh, as mentioned in the previous section, many victims are unable to carry out the legal process or give up on the legal process because of the fear that they will experience secondary victimization. Although complete success has not been achieved yet, but countries have started to work to fulfill their responsibilities in this regard. Let's take a look. In Germany, as you can see at the chart, there are about 8,000 reported sexual violence crimes annually. The number of unreported cases is much higher. Only 8% are reported to the police, according to the sources. As stated in the German Grivio report, in order to prevent secondary victimization in Germany, opportunities to provide legal and psychological support were provided to the victim during the reporting and court process. And also a notification system about the perpetrator and these issues were stipulated in the German Code of Criminal Procedure, as you can see at the right. As long as no rise of presence exists for accused persons, law enforcement authorities generally ensure that perpetrators and victims are questioned separately during the investigation and that unnecessary encounters are avoided. In United Kingdom, as you can see the chart, uh, the year ending March 2020, Crime Survey for England and Wales estimated that 1.5, 1.6 million adults had experienced sexual assault by rape or penetration. Of victims who experienced sexual assault by rape or penetration since the age of 16 years, fewer than one in six reported the assault to the police 
on of those that of someone but not the police. 40% stated embarrassment as a reason and 46, 48% didn't think the police could help and 44% thought it would be humiliating. Um, just like in Germany, there is a notification system for victims of sexual crimes in the United Kingdom. As stated in the UK Public General Act, the notification to be made to the victim in each different situation and duration of these notifications are specified. As you can see in the table, the victim is informed about many incidents related to the perpetrator, and the timeline is written on the code. And let's see some country practices. Um, German Nebenkläger in Germany, the victim acting as Nebenkläger is entitled to legal representation both before and during the proceedings. May examine the case dossier, including the defendant's statement, such as factual investigations, ask questions to witnesses, make closing statements, and be present throughout the trial. He or she is also entitled to file an independent appeal against the judgment. It gives the victim the most possibilities to be heard in the court and to be really part of the proceedings. Um, furthermore, countries also need to ensure that victims are informed of any relevant measures issued for their protection in case of release or escape of the offender. This kind of information allows victims to prepare themselves for a possible encounter in the street. Uh, victim notification scheme in Scotland, the victims are entitled to receive the following information about the offender throughout the victim notification sheet. As you can see in the table, the victim is informed about many incidents related to the perpetrator, like the date of that, date of the prisoner's release, and if the prisoner has been transferred out of place out of the Scotland, the perpetrator's notification get the victims. And victim can choose to receive this information by registering in the scheme. Uh, furthermore, victims are also entitled to make representation to the parole board for Scotland. And thank you for listening. Um, the next part will be presented by Ozan Geek, my teammate, and also our team captain. Ozan, next is your turn. Thank you very much, Ebru. Just let me share my screen. I guess you're able to see now. Members of the jury, dear professors and dear colleagues, my name is Ozan Geek, as my teammate Ebru has just introduced, and I will be presenting you a case from the European Court of Human Rights, which is titled Y versus Slovenia case, and, and which is re related to revictimization and retraumatization of women in criminal proceedings. First of all, let me begin with telling you a little bit about the facts of the case and the decision of the domestic court. And afterwards, I will be elaborating on the assessment of the European Court of Human Rights. This case is concerning a sexual assault to a child who was 14 years old at the time that assault took place. And during the domestic proceedings, the court appointed many experts. And one of the gynecology experts that the court appointed, who was B in the case file, B presented an orthopedics report to the applicant, which was stating that access the perpetrator's left arm is disabled. The important point over here is that if X's left arm was disabled at the time of the assault, then the assault would not be able to take place in the way that the applicant described in her testimony. According to the applicant, X was able to use his left arm. The applicant had seen X carrying heavy stuff and also that the, uh, per the perpetrator has licenses for all types of vehicles, including manual vehicles, which require the use of the both arms. Therefore, the applicant requested the, an orthopedics expert, the appoint, appointment of an orthopedics expert. However, this request was rejected by the domestic court. And coming to the perpetrator's ex's lawyer, who was M in the case file, according to the allegations of the applicant, she, the applicant and her mother, her mother had consulted uh, the lawyer of the, of the perpetrator several times before the initiation of the proceedings regarding the same issue and which is concerning the same perpetrator the, uh, the, being X. However, M denied this pro these allegations and the request for the disqualification of M by the applicant was rejected by the domestic court. During the cross examinations at the hearings, there were many insulting questions by which were asked by X to the to the victim. 
and these are not even some of them were not even questions but by but some statements such as the victim would cry to manipulate people just like she was doing at the courtroom and also the perp the perpetrator alleges that the victim had confided him that she would like to dominate men while having sexual intercourse and such and uh, so much more questions and statements uh, such as these and also as a final fact, the proceedings took more than seven years for the first instance court to render an award. And the final decision of the court was the acquittal of acts from all charges. Now, coming to the assessment of the European Court of Human Rights, I have just mentioned that the proceedings took more than seven years and the European Court of Human Rights found this time to be too much and to be against the procedural requirement of problems. And uh, with regards to the cross-examinations and the statements made by acts, the European Court of Human Rights found this insulting to the to the victim and decided that the domestic judge should have intervened and should not have allowed such statements or questions. However, uh, this actually led to the revictimization and re-traumatization of the victim in these proceedings. And regarding M, who was uh, the perpetrator's lawyer that I had mentioned, the European Court of Human Rights decided that the domestic court, the domestic judge acted in accordance with the domestic law However, that the domestic law was not sufficient to take the victim's interest into consideration. And regarding the examination, which was made by B, the gynecology expert who presented an orthopedics report, the European Court of Human Rights decided that B, as a gynecology expert, exceeded what was asked from him as a gynecology expert by presenting an orthopedics report. And finally, the European Court of Human Rights decided that there was a violation of Article 3, being the prohibition of torture, and Article 8, right to respect for private and family life under the European Convention on Human Rights. And all of these factors and the facts that I have mentioned basically led to the revictimization and re traumatization of the victim in these proceedings. Thank you very much for listening to me. This ends my presentation. Now I am giving the word to my teammate, Oznur, who will be presenting another case. Thank you. Good afternoon, my dear professor and my colleagues. My name is Aznatish and I will be presenting NC versus Turkey case. The case is about the child sexual abuse. The applicant, who was only 12 year old at the time of her complaint, uh, was forced to work as a prostitute by two women. 28 individuals were charged against the rape of a girl age under 15, forced imprisonment for the fulfillment of sexual desires, forced imprisonment and incitement to the prostitution. The applicant went underwent several medical examinations she, that she refused one of them. A size court upheld the decision regarding the pretrial detention of 27 suspects, but within the six months, all defendants were released. During the hearings, NC had been placed opposite the defendants and had been obliged to recount in detail the threats and rapes again and again. And even her father uh, excluded from the hearing because of this uh, detailed explanation. And relatives of defendants attacked NC and her representatives after the hearing. For this reason, they request that trial transfer as well, but the request dismissed. The re defendants were acquitted for the charge of uh, against rape of a girl age under 15 for lack of evidence. Regarding the charge of forced imprisonment for fulfillment of sexual desires, a size court recollects to fight the uh, charge again and uh, had that NC was not totally unwilling. As a result of this, for all defendants, forced imprisonment for fulfillment of sexual desires and five defendants inside of the prostitution struck out. In size court considered the contest of a child as an equivalent way to the contest of an adult in case of sexual assault. A size court decided to impose in minimum sentence of remaining defendants and criminal proceedings lasted around 11 years and there was an inactive period about five years and the um, charge of false imprisonment and the charge of incitement to prostitution had been struck out um, as being tampered. The applicant complained that her personal integrity was not protected. She never received professional support and criminal proceedings were excessively long. According to the ACHR case law, when it comes to child sexual assault, human dignity and 
and psychological interpretive requires special attention. The best interests of the child must prevail and national authorities must adequately protect the needs of children's particular vulnerabilities through the criminal proceedings to protect the victim against secondary victimization. Once she experienced during the proceedings were traumatic for the applicants, but national authorities had taken no measure to protect applicants dignity and private life. And all of the cases had been complicated through the difficulty of the establishing facts, as well as a number of defendants, any delay could not be attributed to applicant and representative conduct. Repeated medical examinations uh, one of the reasons for excessive length of proceedings. And was this worse from the beginning of the proceedings? She never received professional support for a psychological or a welfare assistant, although she was a vulnerable situation before that age. The SHR held that conduct of national authorities did not comply with the requirement of properness and diligence in cases which requires special attention and absolute priority for the protection of children. Considering all of this resulted in serious secondary victimization of the applicants. And SHR held that there had been a violation of Article 3 and Article 8. And I, I would like to thank you for your time and attention, and I now give the floor to my teammates to you. Thank you, Osnur. Dear professors and dear colleagues, uh, I'm Luigi Aksunger, and today I'm Italy. Uh, the applicant was sexually assaulted by seven men, her friend LL and his six other friends. As she applied to the Antiviolence Center, the criminal proceedings started. During the criminal proceedings, the first in instance court acquitted one of the defendants and decided that the rest of the six defendants were guilty. Therefore, six convicts appealed against the decision. The appeal court acquitted all the defendants. Therefore, the applicant lodged individual application to ECHR with the claim of being re-victimized during the legal proceedings because of the attitude of the Italian authorities to our son. ECHR examined the case from two different aspects. First aspect was whether the applicant's personal integrity was violated during the interviews with her. There, ECHR realized that there were some inconsistencies between the applicant's statements and the medical report she was given. Therefore, they can't. However, ECHR emphasized that authorities should strike a fair balance between defendants' right to a fair trial, which includes the cross-examination of the victims, and victims' right to a private life, which includes the protection of their personal integrity, especially if the case is a sexual offense case. Returning back to the material case, ECHR realized that uh, the applicant was never directly confronted by the defendants. Moreover, each time defense lawyers tried to ask questions about the applicant's personal life or personality, the president of the court intervened and interrupted the lawyers. The president of the court also had several short breaks in order to allow the applicant to recover from her emotions. So considering all these facts together, ECHR accepts that it must be difficult for the applicant to talk about the same incident repeatedly. However, the particularly difficult ordeal experienced by the applicant cannot be attributed to Italian authorities. ECHR also examines the content of the judicial decisions. In the fact that the applicant's mother was ill, her father was away, she had a recent breakup with her boyfriend and she was in a new relationship lately, she used to define herself as a lesbian, but uh, she discovered her bisexuality recently, and um, that was the reason why she was having casual sexual relationship with men during those days. She also showed her red underwear during the day of the incident. Furthermore, appeal court also uh, acknowledged that the applicant had consent during the sexual intercourses. However, this was a weak moment of her and she regretted from her decision because the society would not approve the fact that she had a um, sexual relationship with seven men during one night. And as a reflection of her nonlinear life, 
she wanted to censor such an event and lodged a complaint. So those were all the phrases used in the appeal court's decision. Considering all those phrases, ECHR firstly notes that none of those were neither relevant with the mere facts of attacking the applicant's privacy and personal integrity can't be justified with defense's right to a fair trial. And even though judges should express themselves freely in their decisions, it is limited by their duty to protect the image, privacy, and dignity of the victims. Courts should avoid using sexist stereotypes in their decisions and exposing women to security. CHR rules that the applicant's right to respect for private and family life, which includes her personal integrity, was violated. In conclusion, we can see that it is not enough to protect victims' personal integrity during the investigation and trial processes. Judiciary should also avoid reproducing sexist stereotypes in their decisions too. Thank you for your attention. This was the last presentation of our team. Now. I'm giving floor to Ozan, our team captain. He will explain the solutions we've come up. Thank you very much, Duygu. As Duygu has just introduced, I will be presenting our team's proposal now. As I have very, as we have very limited time, I will be trying to be as quick as I can. So first of all, we have decided to have a resolution at international level, then also at national level. For the international level, we have decided to have a resolution on education and examination on revictimization and re-traumatization of women for, the, for all the judicial authorities of all member states and also for the police officers. For the police officers, the Interpol and Europol, and for the judicial authorities, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime will be determining the standards of the education uh, for the police officers and for the judicial authorities. And now coming to our resolutions at national level, we we basically decided we basically propose that the states shall provide such an education and examination for all judicial members and also for the police officers on the same topic as in the international proposal and this examination and uh, education which will be done by the states will be based on the standards of Europol, Interpol, and also United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime for the judicial judicial authorities. And lastly, we propose a sanction for the police officers and the judicial authorities who cannot meet the minimum requirements of this examination, that they will not be able to be appointed to gender-based violence cases until they successfully complete the examination and the education. And our second proposal at the national level is concerning effective and victim-orienting judicial process over gender-based violence cases. And we propose that the investigations shall start ex officio automatically without ne needing for any complaint by the victim. And also that the, there should not be any delays for be, uh, between the investigation and also in the judicial process. And the judicial process shall be comp completed within a reasonable time. We also propose that the victim and perpetrator shall not directly cross-examine. The victim shall not be directly cross-examined by the perpetrator during the court hearings without any protective measures, such as ordering short recesses. And also, we also propose that, especially if the if the victim is a minor or in a vulnerable in a particularly vulnerable situation, that is even more important. Such uh, some special measures might need to be taken. And we also propose that the as as the as victim repeating the story again and again makes the victim relieve the relieve the trauma again and again and cause re-traumatization re and re-victimization, we propose that the victim's testimony to be recorded by the judicial authorities and so that the victim will not have to repeat the story again and again. Lastly, we propose a psychosocial support during the uh, proceedings, before the proceedings and also after the proceedings for the victim. We propose that these psychologists should be specialized in conducting interviews with the victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you very much for listening to our team's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, well, actually we have a little time for questions. Again, I would like to uh, address my questions concerning your resolutions or your solutions. You um, proposed some articles uh, on three levels. Very fine. I would like to ask you, did you um, make any suggestions at least 
now you can make some suggestion what kind of format you would like to propose these articles in an international treaty or or um, recommendation by an NGO or or what is the format what you imagine what you uh, su suggest in um, which could have this content what you elaborated and uh, another very concrete question concerning the uh, national level uh, steps uh, you argue for the ex officio um, investigations um, and I would like to ask you just whether would you argue that um, obligation for reporting would be also necessary for medical staff or teachers if they are um, if they are realizing that um, a victim could be uh, or there could be somebody a victim of uh, uh, domestic violence or gender-based violence, whether they have to report. Uh, the case for the police officers. So these are two, my two questions. Thank you. Um, actually, regarding the <clears throat> format of our resolutions, for the international level, we are proposing this to be put in a put an international convention, or also it can be um, in a, in a in a resolution of one of the uh, one of the um, United Nations committees, and for our resolutions at national level, we propose this to be put in uh, national bills, national laws of the countries. And regarding the ex officio proceedings and obligation for reporting, actually, we didn't discuss this between ourselves. I, I personally think a reporting uh, obligation for reporting might have some pros and cons. Uh, some pros might be that the uh, perp perpetrator can be helped by, by the authorities. However, cons may be that the, the victims might not even go to the physicians, might not even want to go to the doctors. So I basically am not sure about that. What do my other teammates think? I think because it has some pros and cons, so it needs to be discussed, I believe. Exactly, thank you, Zan, because it's actually a very hard dilemma, uh, bearing in mind that there is that medical uh, confidentiality and maybe the perpetrators with uh, their wives, for example, couldn't even uh, visit a physician in order to treat them properly, since they would be afraid of uh, a kind of um, prosecution. I would like to ask the members of the jury, whether they have suggestions, remarks, or questions to the team. Uh, Christina, uh, Professor Korja, regarding your last question, maybe Turkish citizens know that we have a special crime type, not informing state uh, criminal action by physician. In our system, there is no crime uh, differentiation. Every crime, every type of crime, they have to uh, inform the state. But there is a, a criminological research in Canada, and they say a mandatory reporting law by physician doesn't deter women for seeking medical help. So this is a one significant example I would like to add. And also I have one question. In this team resolution, I noticed the focus is being supportive, being, of course, that's because of topic, uh, preventing re-victimization. In this regard, also in our criminal justice system, a uh, victim also appear as a source of evidence. So we need the statement of victim. We need to uh, taking biological stuff from the uh, traces from the uh, victim. So how we strike balance between, between the, how we get evidence. In this regard, I couldn't see any resolution. What do you think? For that, actually, we are proposing the psychosocial support because in order to collect evidence from the victim, we propose that there should be efficient psychological support to the victim. And uh, that's our proposal, actually. And if I could add something, is that, of course, we need more uh, medical referral centers and the police should always inform the victims that that's what they should do. Uh, in order to provide them with more uh, concrete evidence. Um, and still, we want to protect the victims. So in case of a direct confrontation with the perpetrator, 
could be uh, unbearable, then we could use uh, all the means of technology uh, that could uh, help the victim not to uh, see the actual offender in court. Okay, thank you. This was me. Now it's my turn, okay. Yeah. So thanks a lot once again for your presentation. It's very interesting to listen all of the arguments. And once again, for, for someone who is not dealing with, uh, with criminal law, sometimes I'm shocked with the information that I'm receiving. And now I understand why I'm working only with contracts and torts. There are no emotion in private international law, so it's much easier for me to deal with, uh, with those scenarios. Uh, however, uh, sometimes I'm also seeing some cases that are on the borderline between civil law and criminal law, especially in cases with child abduction. And uh, I was just wondering, what is your position of how are you going to protect a victim if that victim is, uh, is going abroad, is taking the child with her or with him, and the other parent is starting a procedure for uh, reunification, but on the grounds of um, child abduction. How you will then protect the victim once again? Because if you look into the uh, hack conference from uh, convention from 1980, you will see some of the civil aspects of the child abduction cases and how you will reconsider those, those interventions between criminal and uh, civil law. And maybe it's time also for the, because you are, uh, you're proposing some recommendation, maybe uh, the Hague Conference for Private International Law is the bridge that need to be built between these two two types of law, private international law, uh, criminal law, and uh, civil law, especially in the cases for child abduction. Um, if I understood your question co uh, correctly, our proposal is again psychosocial and psychological support to the victim, because we believe even though it might be child abduction to, the, to abroad, uh, again, in order to protect the victim, the psychological support is crucial, we, we believe. So yeah, if you have anything to add. It's also bear in mind that there is a EU directive from 2011 about the European protection order and maybe the regulation uh, number eight, uh, 606 uh, from 2013 on mutual recognition of protection measures in civil matters. So in case of uh, that uh, incident, maybe uh, we could have um, nice collaborations among um, criminal and um, civil matter, civil uh, courts. Thank you. I think that would be all uh, from everyone. So thank you for the questions, remarks, and the answer. Uh, so we, before uh, moving to uh, team number three, we will uh, take a five minutes break if the jury members okay with it. Uh, so after five minutes, uh, we are gonna start with number uh, team number three. Thank you. <laughs> 